The latest computer in Apple's lineup to inherit the snazzy M1 chip is the 24-inch iMac, redesigned with a new color palette and a shockingly thin profile. It's hard to imagine there's much room for repairability in this thing, but as always, we would love to be surprised. The only way inside is through that new 4.5K screen, so thankfully the adhesive holding it in place is forgiving. Our iMac opening tool does the trick perfectly. This is nowhere near as nice as the magnets that held in the ancient iMac screens, but at least it's not iPad adhesive. Our first look inside reveals an empty looking machine, but remember a lot of this space was taken up by the display hardware. One thing's for sure, there's a lot of metal. There's two massive grilled chambers, the stand contact hardware, a plate over the Apple logo, and twin plates covering what looks like a pair of CMOS batteries. Tucked into the chin is the logic board, surrounded by fans and speakers, and masked by this shield. The shield has some torque screws holding it down, but won't fully come out until you remove the extra screws hidden under this black sticker. The board is similar to the one we saw in the M1 MacBook Air and is held down with 2.5mm nuts. A strange choice, but again, anything is better than iPad glue. Before we take a closer look at the silicon, I'll pull the fans out so we can take a look at the whole cooling system together. Four screws hold the heat pipe on, and underneath is the star of the show, the M1 chip. The small heat pipe draws heat away from the M1 and into the heat sinks where it gets blown away by the two fans our mid-tier model comes with. In addition to the 8-core M1 system on chip, this side of the board's got 8GB of SK Hynix LPDDR4 memory, 128GB of Keoxia storage, and a Murata Wi-Fi Bluetooth module. On the back side, there's another 128GB of storage, a Broadcom Ethernet controller for that Ethernet port built into the power supply, and a Cirrus Logic audio codec. To the right of the logic board are some nifty flip-up USB-C port housings. They're secured with more torque screws, and once those are out of the way, you can lift them up and disconnect them. Each unit houses two ports for a grand total of only four ports. That's not a lot for a desktop computer, but at least they're modular. Each side of the iMac is home to newly designed speakers with some pretty cool tricks up their sleeves. Each speaker unit houses two woofers and a tweeter, and to increase the amount of air they're able to displace, they're connected to those giant metal chambers on either side of the iMac. Since this thing is too thin to accommodate a headphone jack around the back with the rest of the ports, it's now on the left side tucked into this corner next to the power button. It's not the simplest thing to fish out, but dispatch a few screws and some gluey cables, and it's yours. Well, we've picked at just about all the interesting bits of this iMac. One last thing to know is the new stand hardware, which isn't removable from the outside like some previous iMacs, so you'll have to take your screen off to make the swap if you didn't buy the Visa mount version from Apple. Now that we're done with the Mac, we can move on to the new Magic Keyboard. We are really only interested in the new fingerprint sensor here, since this is still just a gluey mess on the inside. Our testing revealed that like on an iPhone, the Touch ID sensor in these keyboards is paired to the board that it's built with which is basically what we expected, but we just had to check. So it's safe to say that a lot of impressive engineering went into making the iMac as thin as possible. But did anyone really need an ultra-thin desktop computer? Making the Adhere display the only entry point to the computer complicates all repairs, and switching the iMac over to M1 in such a cramped space eliminates any chance of easy storage or memory upgrades. There are several modular components, but that's not enough to save this from our repairability scale, where it scores a disappointing 2 out of 10. 